is health the absence of a deficiency related disease or is health something more optimal? And that's a big question. And I think we'd have to answer it in the context of vegetarians, uh, older adults, people with certain types of neuromuscular disease, a sarcopenia, certain types of depression are very responsive to creatine. So those patients may have reductions in brain creatine. So it really is a hard question to answer. Welcome to The Proof Podcast, a space for science-based conversation exploring the health and longevity benefits that come with mastering nutrition, physical exercise, mindfulness, recovery, sleep, and alignment. Facts, nuance, and trustworthy recommendations, minus the hyperbole. Hey friends, great to be here with you. I'm your host, Simon Hill. I'm a qualified physiotherapist and nutritionist with an undergraduate science degree and a master's in the science of human nutrition. Today's episode is with the eminent Professor Eric Rawson, recognized within the exercise and nutrition science field as one of the world-leading voices on creatine, a compound found mostly in our muscles and brain. In this exchange, we cover what creatine is, how creatine affects muscle contraction, creatine and brain health, differences in creatine levels between vegetarians and omnivores, creatine supplements, the different forms and dosages, creatine in women, creatine in children, and plenty more. I do want to emphasize that although creatine is usually discussed within the context of athletic performance, this is an episode not only for those looking to optimize their physical performance, but also anyone interested in brain health and cognition. Please do enjoy. This is Eric Rawson and myself talking all things creatine. Hey Eric, welcome to the show. I've uh, read your work on creatine for a number of years now, so it's a, a real pleasure to have this opportunity for you to join us today. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. And we were just having a little laugh uh, offline there about the the fascinating world that Twitter is, and and I've certainly enjoyed uh, your tweets over the years. And it's a, it's an interesting space, isn't it? You can you can kind of comes with with the good and the bad, but there's certainly a lot of good and and a lot of learning that can be had on on Twitter if you kind of focus in the right places. Absolutely. Uh, with with Twitter, I'm I'm able to find people like you and uh, scientists who I wouldn't normally interact with, a- and you know, you ask the question, they respond, and and uh, it's a great opportunity to learn. Mm-hmm. You know, minus minus all the flaming of each other. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You need to be uh, careful of that for your sanity. That's for sure. <laughs> Perhaps to to sort of kick things off here it might be nice to share a little bit of history. I know that okay. the I, I, I looked into how far back research into creatine goes and, and I saw that it goes a long, long way back to the 1800s, I believe. And, I, and I'm interested in hearing from your perspective, what are some of the, the sort of seminal pieces of research on creatine that, that put this sort of compound that is now a household name onto the map and and perhaps even inspired your own research into this area? That's a great a great question and, and a great place to start. So you're, you're correct. Creatine, uh, the first paper that I've been able to obtain on the discovery of creatine, that publication was 1832. So we, we have been studying creatine for about 200 years. And um, it was really the, the hot topic in the 1800s and, and early 1900s. If you thumb through old issues of the Journal of Biological Chemistry, sometimes half of the papers are on creatine. And, and the astonishing thing, given the role of creatine in energy metabolism, was there's about 100 years of research before the discovery of uh, ATP and the creatine kinase reaction and the actual role of creatine and muscle metabolism. So uh, scientists were studying, you know, the, the content of uh, different muscles and, and the degradation of creatine, but really couldn't uh, flesh out the function in, until the discovery of ATP. What, what's also very interesting to me is that the, the great chemist, uh, Justice von Liebig, uh, he marketed an extract of meat supplement back in 1847 which was really a high creatine supplement. And then the, the first human supplementation study that I'm aware of was the early 1920s. Mm-hmm. And uh, there were no muscle biopsies then. 
uh, but they could uh, measure creatine output in the urine. Normally, there's really no creatine in the urine. Uh, and uh, the two authors of the paper, it, it looks like they, they themselves were the research volunteers. So they loaded themselves with creatine and realized that not all of it was recovered in the urine, mm. meaning the supplement was staying somewhere in the body. And, and that's 100 years old, that paper. Uh, so they, they got so much work done without the modern technologies. And then, you know, we fast forward um, to the 1960s and the perfection uh, of the, and, you know, the popularity of the muscle biopsy technique. And, and this was really the first time that we could say what was happening to things like muscle glycogen, muscle creatine, you know, as a consequence of exercise and as a consequence of um dietary manipulations. So um, I think at that stage in the 60s and 70s, really what was going on was a lot of carbohydrate, dietary carbohydrate manipulation and exercise um, tests and muscle biopsies. And no one had really done any work in the creatine space until 1992. And, and that was the really the modern start of creatine supplementation. So that's the paper from uh, Roger Harris and, and Karen Soderlund and Eric Hultman. And it was simply a descriptive study, you know, feed people creatine and measure what happens to their blood creatine and their muscle creatine. And what we learned from that study was that you can increase muscle creatine in humans with oral creatine supplementation. And um, additionally, we learned that exercise augments the response. And, and we also learned that those of us who have low creatine have the largest response to supplementation. Mm -hmm. and, and if you have naturally high muscle creatine, you have a smaller response. Mm -hmm. So we got yeah. all that from the one paper and, and then the floodgates opened. Yeah. I want to, I want to kind of circle back to that idea of your baseline creatine levels mm -hmm. at some point, if we, if we get the opportunity and, and chat about say sure. vegetarians versus omnivores who potentially have different baseline levels and, and perhaps the differing effect that supplementation may have or, or offer to such people. Um, I'm interested in kind of, this is a broad sort of question, but creatine as a, an ergogenic compound and it seems okay. like it's the most studied uh, out there. Is that because of what you just described, this ability for oral creatine to actually get into the bloodstream and then end up in muscle, which uh, for people listening, that that might seem like something that happens with a lot of compounds, but that's actually quite unique, isn't it? Yes. Yes, this is something that we teach our, our students is, you know, does the compound get where it's supposed to go, right? So on paper, uh, you know, we can describe what a compound will do if you ingest it and it, if it gets into the mitochondria, if it gets into skeletal muscle, if it pa survives digestion, and, and most of them do not. So mm -hmm. this was uh, very, very exciting to have, you know, an inexpensive, widely available uh supplement and and not just a supplement but a nutrient that that's you know consumed in the diet by a, a lot of uh, people uh, that we could we could actually get it past digestion and get it where it was supposed to go inside skeletal muscles now I'll, I'll mention to you before we go on to talk about you know the ergogenic properties that mm. even though Roger's paper came out in 92 proving that we can increase skeletal muscle with oral creatine supplementation, about a 20% increase on average. Um, certain countries, certain elite sports science coaches were supplementing their athletes with creatine absolutely back into the 1980s and probably back into the late 70s. So it, it's one of these instances where the athletes knew first, or mm -hmm. if, if you like, the bro scientists knew before the academic scientists uh, mm -hmm. They they somehow put two and two together and did some self experimentation, and and in the ninety two Olympics, two gold medalists in track revealed to the press that they were taking creatine supplements, and that was before any of the modern mm -hmm. research came out. So th and, things were ha things were happening with the athletes already. And has there ever been any controversy around the supplementation 
with elite professional athletes or has it always been a kind of approved supplement? No, there's there's always controversy around something that's actually proven effective. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and I would include, and you would recognize that caffeine is one of those substances. Sure. Right? You know, how do you ban caffeine when it's the most commonly consumed drug in the world? Well, ethically, it is ergogenic. It does improve endurance performance. Um, more recently, a lot of work has come out showing improved strength and power performance. Uh, and um, caffeine has a lot of ergogenic benefits, you know, in a mm-hmm. lot of different circumstances. So does that break half of the the, the code about using performance enhancing substances? Mm-hmm. Uh, certainly, it's a very safe substance. It's a widely available substance. So there was a lot of discussion at the beginning. Um, but really, uh, this is a, a nutrient that's commonly mm-hmm. consumed in, in, a non, in an omnivore diet. So how do you how do you go about mm-hmm. banning a, a nutrient? You know, we could argue that you know calcium has benefits for athletes, or or you know a lot of essential nutrients. Mm-hmm. And also the the body synthesizes it which complicates things further i know that that doesn't uh that doesn't preclude a a compound from being banned like we could point to testosterone which the body also produces but uh it's 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 an interesting compound to think of for a variety of reasons one being that some does come through the diet depending on the way that you eat your body does produce it and then there seems to be some or not some, quite a lot of research suggesting that adequate may be different to optimal. Yes. And all of that I'd like to to kind of dig into, but it, it may make sense to kind of first start with what type of compound creatine actually is and where it, where is it synthesized in the body? How does the body sure. go about doing that? Sure. So um, normal, and this is a on average for the whole population. So it's a simplistic approach, but uh, normal creatine turnover is about two grams per day. So we're expecting one gram per day to come from exogenous sources, the diet, and one gram per day from endogenous production. Uh, Creatine is produced from um, a a group of amino acids in the liver, pancreas, and and kidney. And here's what makes creatine supplementation so optimal. There, there is a complete separation between the sites of synthesis and utilization, right? So about 95% of the body's creatine is stored in your skeletal muscles, and that's where it's used to produce uh, ATP, where it's used in energy production during times of very high energy demand. But creatine isn't made in skeletal muscles. It's manufactured in the liver, pancreas, and kidneys. So mm. skeletal muscle readily takes up creatine. Right. Not all substances and, you know, uh, other substances, you will have a difficult time getting them into the muscle, but, uh, the muscles are ready to take up creatine because they're designed to take up creatine produced in other parts of the body and to take up creatine that's, uh, ingested with the diet. So then about 95% of it's stored in your muscles and, and most of the remaining 5% in the brain. And with regards to, the compound being considered essential or non-essential uh, terms yeah. that are often used to describe whether one needs it in the diet or not. So you've just explained there the typical person would would sort of the in, endogenously produce about one gram a day, and then another one gram would come through the diet. Do you consider this uh, a non-essential nutrient, and that for sort of adequacy your body will produce enough and that one gram is enough to to be adequate yeah th- that's a great question and and you're one of the few people who's ready to discuss this <laughs> or who has even really probed <laughs> this question uh and i think that's because of of your background and and your your other interests so i i guess the the way to frame it is that there is a there is a wide range of what is considered normal muscle creatine values. And um, if you have low muscle creatine, there doesn't appear to be an impairment. However, in um, there are some very rare genetic disorders, uh, and these are disorders of creatine transport or creatine synthesis. These occur in children, and the consequences are, are 
rather devastating. Uh, they are very, very sick. And the only way that you can rescue them is with creatine supplements. Mm -hmm. um, and um, this is an extreme example, but it shows you that it's, it's not so easy. There, there's kind of a spectrum here of normal or, or adequate and, you know, severe, um, severe disease. And um, what I think we're nutrition is struggling to move away from being the study of def deficiency diseases. Mm -hmm. and, and we're in this phase of, you know, is there a difference between preventing a deficiency disease and optimal health? But I don't think very many people are, are studying it that well. So the, the question becomes, if, if you don't have a genetic defect that reduces your brain creatine levels to zero and makes you very, very sick, if that's not you, um, w will you benefit from purposefully adding some creatine to your diet? And, and even that's a simplistic question. There's a, a recent paper using the NHANES data set, very large data set showing that, oh, um, I think um, 40 40% of Americans aren't getting enough creatine based on the old perspective of uh, one gram endogenously produced and, and one gram uh, exogenously consumed. So mm -hmm. most people aren't getting enough creatine in their diet. Does that mean they're deficient? No. Does that mean their health is not impacted? Um, is a big question. And then there are some creatine researchers really calling for creatine to be reclassified as conditionally essential. Mm -hmm. So not non-essential and not essential, but conditionally essential. And I think that's fair. And I mean, even to go another kind of step back, you spoke about the, the various organs that produce creatine. Mm -hmm. What's that dependent on? Because that that would be dependent on some yes. essential essential building blocks to actually <laughs> synthesize that creatine in the first place as well. Yes, you are you are very wise. So it's it's not as simple as just concerning yourself with creatine. It's the building blocks. So uh, dietary methionine, dietary glycine, uh, or the levels in the body, uh, and and methionine. We we could we would encounter that in any conversation about um, protein, meat eaters versus vegetarians, uh, because that's an amino acid that's well known to be, you know, deficient in certain plants. Uh, and, and food combining usually takes mm -hmm. care of it. But it makes studying creatine on a population level much, much more difficult. You know, not just do you have enough creatine, is do you have enough precursors for the synthesis of creatine? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. If someone's listening and they're thinking, this is super interesting, I, I wonder if uh, genetically I'm I'm producing enough creatine and uh, you kind of alluded to it, uh, I'm assuming that there are a number of different genetic sort of polymorphisms that could affect this and there's probably a bit of a spectrum like many compounds where yes. it might not be that you're producing zero uh, but you may fall somewhere along that spectrum and, and be producing less than the next person. Is there, is there a sort of routine laboratory test or way for someone to go and objectively quantify where their creatine levels are at? Yes. Un unfortunately, the answer is absolutely not. Mm. <laughs> so uh, well, the first reason is that skeletal muscle creatine and uh, plasma creatine might be related, but they're not so directly correlated that there's, there's a relationship like you could, you could not use under most instances, plasma creatine as a proxy marker for blood creatine. So it can't mm -hmm. be a simple blood test. And the other thing is if you went to any medical center anywhere in the world and said, I would like a blood creatine test, they would say, you mean creatinine. And, and you would say, no, no, that's the breakdown product of creatine. And they would say, I've never heard of a blood creatine test. I'm sure you mean creatinine. And, and mm -hmm. they, they probably don't even have the ability to do it at the lab. They'd have to look it up and figure out how to do it. It's just not a standard test. So you, you need either a, an MRI that, that uses spectroscopy to get concentrations instead of images, or you need a muscle biopsy. Mm -hmm. It's, it's really quite fascinating because 
uh, it seems like the carbohydrate system is very, very responsive to um, different different things such as eating less carbohydrate or eating more carbohydrate or exercise training and, and increasing your muscle's ability to uh, synthesize glycogen, but creatine's a bit different. So uh, I'll, I'll reveal about myself that um, I'm not a fan of, of long endurance types of activities. I, I, for me, I'm a 30 seconds or less mm -hmm. type of guy. Mm -hmm. and, that makes two um, of us. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> uh, so I, I've spent my entire life, you know, sprinting or in the weight room. It's it's always been about strength and power. Uh, I do consume a, a fair bit of high creatine foods, and when I finally had my muscle creatine measured, I was, you know, the the lowest levels of muscle creatine in the entire study, and it, it made perfect sense to me because I'd already uh, experimented with creatine supplements and was convinced that I was having a larger response than anyone, uh, or, you know, uh, anyone I'd spoken with. And, and the, I was in graduate school at the time and the faculty said, you don't know that for sure. And I said, I'm telling you my performance in the weight room, the, the weight gain, this, this really works well with me. And finally we got me in a magnet and my muscle phosphocreatine was incredibly low despite a lifetime of high creatine foods and despite a lifetime of sprinting. And, and when you look at the research, it doesn't seem like the creatine phosphocreatine energy system responds to stressful exercise like sprints that would, that would specifically stress the creatine phosphocreatine energy system. So if you train like a, a marathon runner, I know all these metabolic adaptations will occur regarding fat and carbohydrate metabolism. But if you train like a sprinter, it doesn't seem to do anything to creatine and phosphocreatine. You're kind of born with it. Mm -hmm. And that's it. Thankfully, you can top off the tank with the supplement. With some of these kind of supplements or uh, different areas of nutrition and health, you often hear the term hyper-responder. Yeah. And you just got me thinking there about your personal experience. Is, is that a as sort of something that's been tested and, and proven with creatine? Are there, are there certain people out there that you would say are going to benefit more so and do experience that? Yes, ab absolutely. Um, but we, we have to say that we're specifically talking about skeletal muscle at mm -hmm. the moment and, and not brain metabolism. So in, in skeletal muscle, there's a nice relationship that those of us who have the lowest muscle levels have the largest increase in response to supplementation. But everyone really has an increase. So the increase might be small, medium, or large. And, and with my students, I, I use a gas tank analogy. You know, if your tank is on full, you can, mm. you know, top off the tank. If, you're, if your gas tank is half empty, you can add a, a lot more in there. Uh, and so you do get this situation of low responders, medium responders, and high responders. Um, but everyone is a responder and, mm -hmm. and you can augment the response a little bit by combining it with carbohydrate and protein. Uh, and that seems to stimulate muscle creatine uptake a bit better, just like exercise mm -hmm. does. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, there's a very clear relationship in the muscles between starting point and, and response. I want to talk a little bit about co-ingestion uh, in a little bit, but while we're on this idea of, of some people perhaps getting Bennett, mm -hmm getting larger benefit, a greater magnitude of benefit through supplementation. Are there studies that have quantified the, the kind of baseline differences between a, a vegetarian and a typical omnivore? What are, the, what are we talking about in terms of the, the size difference in creatine stores? It's a great question. Um, th there are no exact numbers, and, and there's probably not – exact numbers for a lot of these measurements we're interested in, like, um, you know, cholesterol's a range and mm -hmm. um, calcium's a range. So creatine is a range, but I, I think it's because it's been approached like having low muscle creatine is no big deal. People haven't been paying attention to that range as much as they should have. So there's a small number of studies where they either um, measured vegetarians or they converted people to a vegetarian diet and watched their muscle creatine rapidly decrease. So blood creatine 
uh, is about 60% lower in vegetarians. And muscle creatine is on average, oh, I'd say about 20% lower. I've, I've seen some studies say around 15% and some studies say, you know, more like uh, 25 or 27%. So if, if we pick an average and say 20% lower baseline muscle creatine and, and maybe 60% lower blood creatine, uh, I think those are very those are very good roundabout measurements to describe a, a, a non-meat eater. So would it be kind of fair to say that the average, and I know we're talking averages here, but the average, and you and I are not average and the listener's not average, but <laughs> if we are talking averages here, uh, the average vegetarian would potentially get more benefit through creatine supplementation than the average omnivore because of that lower baseline. Absolutely. And uh, there is, again, this is the, this is one of the smaller parts of, of the large body of creatine supplementation mm -hmm. literature. But, uh, if you look at the individual values, so, um, omnivores on average may have a 20% increase in muscle creatine with supplementation. With vegetarians, it's typically, uh, high, it's always higher, possibly much, much higher, right? D depending on the, you know, the starting values. So I, I've seen a vegetarian, increases of, of 40% and 50% and even higher uh, in some individuals mm -hmm. um, from creatine supplementation. So we expect the increase in tissue levels to be higher. And then subsequently, you know, depending what your sport performance is, we expect you to gain a larger ergogenic effect if you're mm -hmm. starting out with very, very low levels like a vegetarian. Is it possible through diet to consume enough creatine? I know you, you said per personally you were eating a lot of creatine-rich foods, but your levels weren't super high. Uh, do, you, do you think that it, the, the sort of optimal amount of creatine could be achieved through diet alone? That's a great question too. Can you achieve the optimal amount of muscle creatine through diet alone? In, I think in, in general, we're supposed to say yes, because everyone exists in this massive, normal, healthy range. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, so if you don't have a creatine deficiency disease and you're not symptomatic, are you then fine? Uh, that, that's a, you know, a, a, a bit different question uh, because we're, Again, we're transitioning nutrition from, you know, is health the absence of a deficiency-related disease or is health something more optimal? Mm -hmm. And that, that's a big question, and I think we'd have to answer it in the context of vegetarians, uh, older adults, um, people with certain types of neuromuscular disease, uh, sarcopenia, um, certain types of depression uh, are mm -hmm. very responsive to creatine. So those patients may have reductions in brain creatine. So it, it, it really is a hard question to answer. Mm -hmm. um, and, and as we mentioned earlier, it appears that the population isn't even getting that minimal amount of creatine uh, from based on the NHANES data, which I, I think is has not been talked about that much. Mm -hmm. So is, is this something that we should be looking at practically like, like in, in the United States, we look at calcium. We, we say, yes, you can do this with food, but will you? No. <laughs> so what are you going to do about mm -hmm. it? You know, how can we get you to consume m more food to get to calcium? And, and with creatine, it's different because this is conflated with um, the precursors, which are amino acids which it's it's possible, not not required, but it's possible that certain vegetarian diets might be uh, deficient in one or two of the involved amino acids. Mm -hmm. It's a really great question, but it, it's more like a it's more like a conference on mm -hmm. on that question than yeah. just answering it. <laughs> no, I think you did a great job explaining that, and context matters. But and 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 as you say, often what's you know what's theoretical versus realistic and and practical, and they might be yes. two different things. So, yes. with regards to to improving performance, if we kind of zoom in on that, uh, firstly here, and, and I do want to get to brain health. I know that you've studied that extensively as well, and that's a super interesting space. I'm I'm sure that there are folks listening 
I've heard you reel off ATP and, and they're, they're kind of interested in learning about some of the specifics with regards to creatine and their performance. So if we zoomed in on the level of, say, a muscle cell, mm-hmm. what is, is creatine actually doing that leads to enhanced power, strength, and, and resistance to fatigue, all that sort of stuff? Sure. So uh, ultimately, all, all of our macronutrients, carbs, fats, and protein, if, if they're going to contribute to energy production, they, they have to arrive at the compound adenosine triphosphate, ATP. That's the, the only thing that fits on, on the head of the uh, of myosin inside your muscle cell. It's the only thing that allows muscle contraction to occur. And so, you know, we have backup systems. We have a small amount of ATP in our body, and then we have backup systems that can be used to replenish ATP while we're exercising. So we can break down fat to make ATP. We can break down carbohydrate to make ATP. And we have a, a small amount of phosphocreatine in our muscles. So when we, we break down ATP and our muscles contract, we immediately need to replenish that. And when you lop off one of the phosphates of ATP, you have to get a phosphate from some place. And that comes from phosphocreatine or what some people call creatine phosphate. So what you're actually doing here is you're increasing the size of the creatine phosphate or, or the phosphocreatine pool inside your muscles. Mm-hmm. So if you think of, you know, if you were to run as fast as you could for a uh, hundred meters, uh, if you just had some ATP in your muscles, you wouldn't make it a hundred meters. You'd, you'd, your muscles wouldn't be able to contract. You'd be out of fuel. So the backup system starts and phosphocreatine donates its phosphate to this chemical reaction. Your muscles continue to contract. So the, the breakdown of phosphocreatine is, is unbelievably fast. It's a limited supply, but it, it's, it's instantaneous. So that's the energy system that allows us to do that 10 seconds of maximal sprinting. And, and certainly mm-hmm. uh, it contributes a large amount to 20 seconds or 30 seconds of sprinting. And now you start to see how it's relevant to things like uh, football or, or rugby, where there's intermittent b- bouts of sprinting. Uh, and, and you can find you know, high intensity exercise where we rely on creatine phosphate to supply energy, you can find high intensity exercise in the Tour de France. They, they sprint the last 30 seconds to the finish line mm-hmm. every single stage, you know? So there's, there's a, a great deal of evidence, hundreds of studies to show that if you load a muscle with creatine through supplementation and you challenge someone with 30 seconds or less of maximal, very high intense exercise, their performance will improve. And then there's also uh, some nice, really well done studies that show if you embed those sprints into a long endurance ride or put it at the end of an endurance challenge, you also get an ergogenic effect. And then that's mm-hmm. the cycling analogy. So can really benefit athletes across a, a wide spectrum, not just the 100 meter sprinters among us. And in that case, in endurance exercise, are you, are you talking about from a supplementation protocol point of view, just saturating the, the cells with creatine before exercise, or is it something that, that an athlete would be consuming during that endurance bout? That, that's a great question. I, I think the, the bulk of the research suggests that we should be uh, increasing muscle creatine content um, before the actual athletic event. Mm-hmm. There's very few studies on the effects of pre-exercise or during exercise creatine ingestion. Um, because, um, once, once your muscles are kind of super saturated with creatine, that's where they remain for, for weeks. So there's a big difference here between muscle glycogen. You, you know, if you and I mm-hmm. carbohydrate load and, and then we go for a bike ride, uh, our muscle glycogen levels decrease and, and they don't increase until we eat carbohydrate and, and, uh, re- refill the tank. But phosphocreatine, you know, it declines during intense exercise. And then it resynthesizes itself back to baseline in about three or four minutes. So um, really, we haven't figured out why it would be beneficial during exercise. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, that's that's uh, before we started thinking about the cognitive effects. And and I I do know some athletes who take, you know, their creatine once a day um, prior to 
whatever athletic challenge they're participating in, and, and they claim that there's mm-hmm. um, a, a beneficial effect on mental clarity. But for the most part here, we're, we're talking about filling up the tank before you before you get on the bike. What about this idea that that post exercise is a, a good time to replenish creatine stores? Is there any sort of scientific validity to that? Sure, um, it's so the, the 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 muscle creatine uptake is insulin mediated. So yeah. you can augment muscle creatine uptake in a few ways. One would be to inject yourself with insulin, but you'd probably die, so we don't recommend that. The other, the other would be much easier, and that would be eat a nice meal, mm-hmm. right? So if you, you know, uh, carbohydrate and protein combinations, uh, which we would expect athletes to be eating, you know, uh, if, if you have a large post-exercise or post-training meal, which most people do, that would be a good time to take your creatine because you'll have a large hyperinsulinemic response and, and that will augment muscle creatine uptake. Exercise has insulin-like effects. It does the same thing. So uh, I think if you're going to take creatine once a day, that's probably the, the, the best time. Not, mm-hmm. not urgent. You don't have to consume it in your automobile while you're sitting in the parking lot, uh, not in the locker room. You can make it home and cook your, your meal and... and um, you know, or you could, I know some athletes will make that part of their kind of post-exercise snack, Mm -hmm. which might be a a carbohydrate protein type of beverage before they shower or sit down and cook. But I think the Mm -hmm. post-exercise period, and and I don't mean immediate, I I think that's, that's a a great place. I guess the only folks that may want to consider uh, having their creatine with insulin uh, or exogenous insulin are are those that are living with diabetes but again that will probably pair with when they're about to eat a meal as well yes it it will it it, i i think we've overcomplicated it you know um you you could you could augment muscle creatine uptake by eating you know some sort of a candy bar which would have a very Mm -hmm. large hyper and insulinemic response so everyone's saying what's the ideal carbohydrate and you know what's the difference between fructose and glucose and and you could literally just go eat Mm -hmm. and take your creatine at the same time and and that would work very well what's the 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 magnitude you spoke to hundreds of studies that have looked at this and different types of performance what's the kind of magnitude of benefit that maybe someone could expect to to experience that's a great question and it's it's so hard to quantify because um of the different types of performances that we're describing you know, so in, in some cases, it's it's something like repeated vertical jumps, or, or in another case, it might be repetitions in the bench press, or a 30-second cycling sprint, or, you know, a 10-second cycling sprint. So the time domain is often different. And then, you know, if you start to add in things like swimming, uh, th- that's a completely different effect. It, it, you know, the effect is not large. And, and it shouldn't be, right? Because this is a nutrient. This is a, a naturally occurring nutrient that our bodies already have uh, great stores of. So we shouldn't expect drug-like effects. And, and this, this doesn't produce drug-like effects. But, you know, let's say uh, on the order of 4 or 5%, something like similar to um, a caffeine response or, or, you know, some of the other few dietary supplements that, mm-hmm. that have a performance-enhancing effect. So not large, but, you know, practically speaking, very, very important. So a 5% improvement in, in, you know, the 100 meter sprint in in track and field or a swimming event, my gosh, that's, they they win and lose races by the hundredth of a second. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, so it's important with the elites, but um, what if you're an an older adult and and you, you have physical frailty? Uh, and this is allowing you to um, get up the stairs more safely, more powerfully. Uh, what if it improves your activities of daily living? Certainly, that's not a small effect then. Hmm, and and for, for the average, the average humans among us, um, you know, in in creatine it is at its best, I think, in the weight room. You know, so there, there's the difference between sports performance, a sports performance aid and a training aid. So repeated bouts of high intensity exercise, we like to give people this image like a, 
a, a football field or a rugby field. But this is what we do in the gym. We squat, we rest for two minutes. We squat, we rest for two minutes. And creatine is ideal there. So if you believe that your strength and conditioning program will translate into better athletic performance or perhaps a better quality of life, this is, enhances your performance in the weight room. And, and to me, that's major. Yeah, I've, I've been taking five grams a day of creatine mm-hmm. monohydrate for as long as I can remember. And we can, we can dig into the, the, the type of creatine and, and whether that dosage is, is uh, well supported by the evidence in a moment. But you were talking earlier about creatine's role in replenishing ATP mm-hmm. and this being uh, crucial to the production of energy and, and performance. Why not, and this will be a silly question, but I think it's worth asking, why not just take a, a, an oral form of ATP and and sort of bypass creatine? Uh, the simple answer is it's supposed to get destroyed by digestion, and, and I believe it will get destroyed by digestion, uh, and whatever doesn't will not increase your body's ATP stores. Unfortunately, um, for anyone listening, you'll be able to find the, the one-off study where ATP supplements produce this enormous ergogenic effect. And, and these are data that will not be reproduced. And, and these are data that will, will not be built upon because I, I think it was a very curious finding. Uh, and, and it, it, you know, what we're looking at with creatine is replication on the order of hundreds of studies. Uh, and, and mm. certainly eating ATP, it shouldn't get through digestion. I don't believe it does, but people have tried it and occasionally found something curiously. <laughs> Tell me a little bit more about the the science looking into creatine supplementation and older adults. I know that you mentioned sarcopenia and, and muscle loss and, and how that can affect someone's yeah, this, quality this of life. A- what 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 studies do we have that have have actually looked at creatine supplementation in a kind of clinical trial manner with with this population? This is actually a, a fairly large body of literature, and this is something that we were. Um, uh, involved with the, the original studies um, back in the mid-90s, uh, it, it just occurred to us that a lot of the things we were talking about, uh, including creatine and, and protein and some other um, nutrients, things we were thinking about to take the biggest and the fastest and the strongest and make them bigger, faster, and stronger. Finally, someone said, why not older adults? Mm-hmm. Uh, where it, where they already have lost some muscle, they already have lost some strength, some power, decreased muscle endurance and muscle mass. And we, we started in the mid nineties giving older adults creatine and looking at the ergogenic effect. And we'd see improved muscle endurance or, or reduced muscle fatigue, if you will. Uh, and then other people started adding creatine to resi- long-term resistance training programs in older adults. And uh, the findings have been very, very positive it, and enough for us to have systematic reviews and meta-analyses just on the effects of creatine on exercise performance and muscle mass in older adults. And it, it's very effective. Mm-hmm. Now, the, the question is, um, do older adults have decreased muscle creatine as a result of aging? And we don't know because all human aging research is confounded by decreased levels of physical activity, right? So the the endocrine environment is changing, you know, reductions in testosterone and growth hormone, and there's type two fiber atrophy, and then there's decreases in physical activity. So what's what's driving an age-related reduction in muscle creatine? We don't really know. Um, We we do see it in some studies, but not in every case. But it, it would bring older adults down to the level of, say, a vegetarian, with a not uh, a clinically deficient, if you will, level of muscle creatine, uh, no no known impairment, uh, but uh, reduced muscle creatine to the point where they would really benefit from the supplement. Mm. So we, we do see that. Does exercise and, and resistance training in particular act as a stimulus for the body's endogenous production? If you are doing more resistance training and you build more muscle, I'm assuming, does the body respond in a way that will produce more creatine? 
Yeah, I don't think it does. And, and that's because we have a few really well done biopsy studies of sprint trained athletes uh, or sprinting athletes, athletes who had undergone sprint training. And also we have multiple resistance training studies where the placebo group didn't have a spontaneous increase in muscle creatine. I'm one of these guys who always checks out the placebo group to see what's, what's going on. Now, the reason I mentioned physical activity as it pertains to the elderly is because what we do see consistently is that extremely low levels of physical activity, such as immobilization, um, cause large reductions in muscle creatine, 25% reduction in muscle creatine if, you, if I put your arm or your leg in a cast. So does that approximate aging? Well, for some people, probably, unfortunately, mm -hmm. but not for all older adults. So physical inactivity versus, um, you know, an immobilization laboratory model is, is, is different, but extremely high physical activity doesn't seem to increase muscle creatine, but extremely low physical activity does seem to decrease it. Mm -hmm. What do we know about the, the dosages for creatine supplementation, say in older athlete in older adults versus athletes, is it a, a similar kind of dosing protocol? Yeah, I, I, I believe it's it's the same. The, the analogy of filling up a gas tank is the same. So the, there there are two approaches here, and and one is if you're in a hurry, take about twenty grams per day for five days, and in, unless you're you know four hundred pounds of muscle. Which, which we don't see often, <laughs> for most human beings, 20 grams per day for five days will get your muscles super saturated. Mm -hmm. Or somewhere between three to five grams per day for about a month will get you to the exact same muscle saturation level. Now, there's a ceiling. Your, your muscles cannot just indefinitely increase creatine content. So if you're in a hurry, do the 20 grams per day for five days load. If you're not in a hurry, about five grams per day, maybe three to five grams per day, depending on size, uh, for 30 days. And, and how would I choose one versus the other? I, I would say if I'm working with a patient population, um, like uh, a frail elder, um, you know, we, we don't really have any evidence that creatine causes gastrointestinal upset, but we get the occasional person in a study, sometimes in the placebo group, sometimes in the creatine group, who has some upset at, at 20 grams per day. Like I said, sometimes in the placebo group too. But if I'm working with an older adult where um, de dehydration is a very serious issue or, or gastrointestinal problems are really going to complicate things, then I would just do the, the maintenance dose. Start with the low dose and, and keep going. Um, but there, there's really not a lot of evidence on the GI upset thing, but I would be ultra cautious. If, if I was working with a patient population, a muscular dystrophy patient, you know, why would I, why would I, um, upset their life so much that they have to take, mm -hmm. you know, 20 grams of powder per day, separate it into mm -hmm. four different shakes, just do the one dose per yeah. day and, and be a little more patient and, and we get to the same place. Yeah. That seems like a, a pretty common sense, uh, approach there. Yeah. What about once you get to that same point and so you've saturated your body, your, mm -hmm. that your, uh, muscle cells with creatine is it something then that you just continue with that sort of three to five gram dose on an ongoing constant basis, or is it something that, that someone would cycle on and cycle off? Great question. So there's, I think there's two parts to this answer. Uh, and one is to compare the creatine, phosphocreatine energy system to like the carbohydrate energy system, right? If, if you and I don't eat carbohydrate for the next 24 hours, our liver glycogen will be down to basically zero. Our muscle glycogen will be much decreased. Um, if we don't eat creatine for the next 24 hours, nothing will really happen, right? It, it takes a few weeks, uh, maybe three weeks on a vegetarian diet to really decrease your muscle creatine levels. So if you're, if you increase your muscle creatine levels to about, you know, 20% above baseline, if you stop taking creatine immediately, it probably takes you about six weeks to get back down to baseline. So if you, you want to continue to have these super saturated levels, you take your three to five grams per day. And if you forget to take it on Monday, don't panic. Don't go through the loading cycle again. It's, 
it may decrease 0.1%, but it's not going to have a major impact. Once you supersaturate your muscles, they're stuck there, and it's going to take you a few weeks for everything to get back down to normal. Now, the, the cycling question is really interesting as well. I, I think if there's any sort of, you know, down regulation, right? And, and that's a word that scares people. Won't my endogenous synthesis be mm. suppressed? And won't there be down regulation of transporters? And I always ask them, you know, are, are you aware what happens with mineral metabolism? If you're on a slightly low calcium diet, won't your body adjust and you'll absorb more from your diet? The same thing with iron. Uh, if you're on a slightly higher diet, won't you excrete more, increase loss? So uh, this is a nutrient. Again, I, I think we can get panic stricken if we treat things like, uh, you know, drugs. powerful pharmacological drugs. Mm -hmm. So if my body decreases endogenous synthesis because my muscles are 20% above what they are w without the supplement, then I'm okay with that. And, and if you look at uh, you know, urinary creatinine levels over time when people are um, washing out with the supplement, so to speak. It, it appears that pe everything returns uh, to, to baseline the, the way it would be. You know, your body's very smart. And this is not the same thing as, say, like this is a, it's a terrible analogy to compare, you know, suppressed endogenous production to something like anabolic androgenic steroids or testosterone, which could really, you know, create an imbalance or shut down your endocrine mm. system, maybe permanently, but commonly for months and years. Mm. With creatine, because this is a nutrient, I don't see a reason to cycle. I think if there is some down regulation, I'm probably happy about that because it's just the body uh, regulating, you know, the, the, the ceiling effect inside your skeletal muscles. Uh, I'm not aware of any, any data that say cycle away. Uh, and mm -hmm. th that's me thinking of it in the context of other nutrients. Hey friends, I hope you're enjoying this episode so far. A quick message from one of our sponsors who makes this show possible, and then we'll jump straight back into things. If you're familiar with my nutrition philosophy, you will know that I'm a huge believer in plant-rich diets being better for people and our planet. You'll also know that I frequently draw attention to what I describe as nutrients of focus. These are nutrients that science shows plant-based eaters, whether plant predominant or exclusive, can fall short in, which can leave you feeling run down, lacking energy, experiencing brain fog, and generally just not as vital as you'd like to be. For that reason, together with Emil, a plant-based health and wellness company, I formulated Essential 8. Essential 8 is your one-stop multinutrient, formulated with DHA, EPA, Omega-3s from algae oil, vitamin B12, iodine, vitamin D3, iron, zinc, selenium, and calcium to perfectly complement your plant-rich diet. I personally take Essential 8 every morning with breakfast, just two capsules, much easier than supplementing with these eight key nutrients individually. What's even more convenient is I have a monthly subscription, so it turns up automatically on my doorstep and I never miss a beat. To get yours, head to theproof.com forward slash friends. That's theproof.com forward slash friends where you'll find a link to purchase Essential 8 that will get you an extra 5% off your first order on top of the significant subscription discount. There will also be a link to this in the show notes. Okay, back to the show. I mentioned that I take creatine monohydrate mm -hmm. and there are many different types of creatine uh, compounds out there uh, that are often marketed to, to folks in the health and, and fitness space. As a researcher in this area, actually conducting science, I I just love to hear your thoughts on whether anyone should entertain any of these other compounds. Are they as well researched? Are they better as some people claim? Sure, and this is one of my favorite questions to answer at conferences because I usually write it in all capital letters on my slides, and and I yell it to the audience. Uh, Ninety nine percent of the research on safety and efficacy is on creatine monohydrate. The products, and there are a lot of them, you are correct, the products that um, advertise increased absorption, well, creatine monohydrate is about 99% absorbed. If you can improve upon that, show me. Uh, but none of these other supplements have muscle uptake data or, uh, you know, um, you know, 
blood kinetics or, or anything like that to support any sort of benefit, they're always mm -hmm. a lot more expensive. There's always a lot less creatine relative to creatine monohydrate. There is simply no reason to ingest a creatine supplement that's not creatine monohydrate. And, and some of them uh, have been shown to be procreatinin supplements where muscle creatine doesn't even increase, but the level of creatinine in your body does. Mm -hmm. And and some of them have almost no creatine in them at all. Um, but, you know, there's just no research in that space. 99% of the safety and efficacy data is on monohydrate. Do you know how most creatine monohydrate supplements are made these days if someone's kind of interested in in the origin of the compound? It's, uh, I can't speak intelligently like from, uh, like a manufacturer could. Um, it's uh, synthetic, so uh, there are no problems for uh, vegetarians. Um, I've been to um, the the company, there, there's one manufacturer left in the world outside of China that manufactures creatine, and that, that's Alschem Degusa, uh, um, or Alschem as, as they're known now. And um, this is the creatine, this is not me recommending their creatine. This is the creatine that I use in research, that I've used mm -hmm. in research funded by the National Institutes of Health. So I've gotten it approved to use that research mm -hmm. on humans through the NIH. Uh, and, and their website has, you know, from some information about purity and, and a bit about manufacturing, but, uh, it's, it's synthetic. Uh, so it's, um, uh, as I said, it, it's not a problem for vegetarians to consume the monohydrate supplement, uh, w which is good to know, but they have a lot of information about the purity of their product, the mm -hmm. quality of their product, manufacturing standards. What was the name of, of that one? I'll put that in the show notes. So Al's Chem, A L Z C H E M, um, they make or they they only market under the Crea Pure brand, and uh, I think what a lot of people don't realize is that there aren't that many supplement manufacturers. There are a lot of supplement mm -hmm. retailers. So if you read the back of the bottle, it often says manufactured for or manufactured by, and so you can buy. Crea Pure Creatine un under a number of different labels. Mm -hmm. So th they would sell it to a, a different retailer, a different manufacturer. Now, now full disclosure, um, Alschem uh, about a year ago asked a, a, a lot of us to sit on their, their scientific advisory board. So I do sit on their scientific mm -hmm. advisory board, um, which, gosh, has, has really reinvigorated creatine research and gotten a lot of people talking mm -hmm. again. So I'm actually very, very, very pleased for that. But um, you know, there are, there are some issues with purity and quality control for other sources of creatine that, that, you know, are, are a concern to me, not the Alschem product, other mm -hmm. products. And, and that's because of the, the 20 gram per day, large dose. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I've, I've studied a fair bit about diet, dietary supplement purity and, you know, this is an issue with herbs. This is an issue in an issue with vitamins and minerals and, and a lot of other products. It's not a creatine specific product. So just to clarify though, Crea Pure is mm -hmm. kind of like a proprietary name that yeah. other brands could use, but that gives you an indication that it leads back to that source you're talking about. Yes, absolutely. And, and I it just, despite the, the, you know, appearance of a conflict here, uh, I'm, I have no problem you know, pointing people in that direction. And again, it's because when anyone asks me, you know, an institutional review board or a funding agency, when they ask me, prove this is a safe and pure nutrient that you're going to supplement humans with, uh, I'm able mm. to do that. And and to me, yeah. that that's quite a standard, um, w which it can't even be achieved with some dietary supplement studies. Mm. No, I think it's good information. I think there'll be a lot of folks that will want to use a creatine that is used in the in the study. So that's certainly um, good information. I've got a question for you on that and the kind of synthetic nature of this. This one often mm -hmm. comes up uh, on Twitter, actually. And what if someone was to say, uh, sort of, quote unquote, this is you know not natural. It's not natural to to take a, a supplement uh, of creatine at a dose that you wouldn't normally naturally uh, get in your diet and that we should be able to just get it all from food. What would your 
response be to that? I'm sure you've had that a, a few times in your career. I've, I've heard that one a few times. It's, um, it's definitely up to the individual and, and your, your, your style of thinking. Uh, you know, if you are, are comfortable stopping with nutrition research at the, um, the elimination of deficiency diseases, right? If that's all you care about is rickets and, and uh, scurvy and, and, you know, anemia, then that, that's fine with me. Um, but we're really looking at nutrients from the perspective of optimal health now. And I think most people aren't aware that, you know, the, the recommended dietary intakes do change and do evolve, uh, and some of them quite contentiously, right? Um, I teach my students, I actually show them the, you know, the, the last edition of the textbook and the current edition and the recommended dietary intake of vitamin D tripled. That's a, that's pretty far off. <laughs> so, you know, nutrition is a very young science. We've been, we've been thinking about nutrition and, and tinkering with nutrition for a long time, but nutritional science is young and we identified the essential compounds and we, you know, eradicated deficiency diseases. Uh, and now we're at this point where, you know, it, it, is this, you know, an unnatural thing that you're doing, but I, I, I like people to ask that question when they're talking about vitamin C mm -hmm. and, and, and calcium and, and um, iron and, and other types of things, um, or even some of the more exotic supplements that people would take, like, uh, you know, ubiquinol or, or uh, antioxidants. You, you know, it, it's really a, a question about um, minimal health and, you know, avoiding deficiency diseases versus optimal health. Mm -hmm. So as you mentioned, you've been taking creatine long term for uh, quite a while. Mm -hmm. And, uh, y you know, uh, how do you feel? <laughs> do, you feel do you feel like you're, you're violating nature's mm -hmm. laws by, by doing that? Um, it, it, it also has to be worked into your diet, right? Because, um, you know, m meat consumption, meat's cost, the, the health effects of the saturated fat in meat, the ability for older adults to, to chew meat or the ability of people to digest meat, um, issues related to climate or, or um, f farming techniques or, or eating animals in the first place, these all have to be put into that, you know, the context of that simple question, are you doing something unnatural? Mm -hmm. You know, to... Yeah, I certainly, I think we kind of share the same view on that and... Mm -hmm. I'm a big believer in, in not ruling something out just because it is quote unquote unnatural and, and looking at the evidence and and trying to, to dig into that question that you're you're putting out there there around what is adequate versus what is optimal and may improve health span, uh, improve right. quality of life. Right. And and this is all wrapped around the the largest issues we have, which are related to obesity physical inactivity, poor physical fitness, and, and cardiometabolic disease. So um, if, if there's any sort of dietary recommendation that can uh, assist people in, um, you know, improving the quality of their life, I'm, I'm certainly interested in that, uh, given that the, the, rest of, <laughs> the rest of the food business seems to be working against them. And the, mm -hmm. the, the rest of, you know, the global environment seems to be working against being a physically active, normal weight, uh, you know, a nutrient rich diet mm -hmm. type of person. So it, it, they're big questions. It's interesting and it might be indicative of a number of, I guess, uh, supplements that have hit the market that perhaps haven't been supported by evidence. But, but performance supplements in general tend to attract a lot more skepticism than, say, a calcium or, or a vitamin C. It seems to kind of just come with the territory. Do you feel like that skepticism is warranted or is it, is it unnecessary? Well, I, I, I feel the skepticism. I, I feel it with uh, journal reviewers, grant reviewers, mm -hmm. uh, parents, um, physicians, clinicians. Uh, I feel it at conferences. And I would go one step further to say that the bias is even stronger. And in my experience, I have no data, but the, the bias, I would say, is even stronger with things associated with muscle building. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I think, uh, for instance, people are very comfortable with uh, anti-obesity weight loss drugs, but a nutrient that might build your muscle is is really um, frightening. Uh, I, I've seen that uh, a lot. And um, I, I think uh, creatine's interesting. Um, you know, one person might uh, be taking creatine because it makes them a better track cyclist or, or because it, it helps them with their sprint, um, you know, in, in or their kick in, in swimming or in track. But most of us are taking it because it allows us to train harder and recover better in the weight room. It, it improves quality of life uh, because it enhances strength and conditioning. So, um, you know, I'm not sure that's very different from uh, adding protein to your diet. I, I get that creatine might be helping you in the weight room and protein is more of an adaptive nutrient after training. But if you increase the protein content of your diet, you know, is that also, you know, uh, you, you know, going against nature and, and performance um, enhancing. If, if, Right, performance enhancement. You're you're increasing your adaptation to your training unnaturally. Mm. Um, you know, I, I don't really um, mm. think that's the, the the best approach because almost everything we're talking about with athletes also applies to muscular dystrophy patients and frail older adults and um, you know so many other really vulnerable populations. Uh, right. So um, there, there's much more at stake here than just you mm. know is that again is that not unnatural. And we haven't even got into the the potential cognitive benefits <laughs> that may be up for grabs for for different populations, which I, I definitely want to leave room for for exploring. Uh, to kind of circle off or, or tie off on this uh, skepticism idea, I think some of that might be uh, born through various views out there about adverse effects. Mm -hmm. with uh, performance-enhancing supplements. And we've kind of touched uh, on a few here, but I'd be interested to hear from you what is the overall kind of safety profile of creatine at the levels that you're talking about, which were that sort of three to five gram a day maintenance dose, perhaps with a 20 to 25 gram a day for four to five days uh, loading phase that you mentioned. What do we know about how safe that is for different populations. So, you know, healthy adults, women of childbearing age, uh, during pregnancy, nursing, kids, uh, all of that. Well, that's a great question. And <clears throat> the, the bulk of the literature is, is going to be on uh, young uh, males and females, young, young men and women, and older men and women, um, but primarily uh, healthy individuals. Uh, and that's just kind of the way exercise research goes with exclusion criteria. Um, so in that body of literature, there are really dozens of uh, safety trials, uh, you know, randomized controlled trials of safety in, you know, kind of the average person type population, as well as athletes and very, very elite athletes. And I think the three areas of focus have been uh, hydration and thermal regulatory concerns, um, muscle dysfunction concerns and, and kidney health. Uh, and, and if we address them one at a time, I would say that the thermal regulatory concerns, there's no evidence of uh, anything to do with dehydration or thermal regulatory problems. And in fact, a number of the studies reveal some physiological benefits uh, to exercising in the heat when you're creatine loaded. Uh, and the military has been very interested in, in that type of an effect so if I creatine load people and I, I put them in the heat chamber in the, in the lab, uh, in some cases, some of their, some of the measurements we would take like heart rate, uh, are actually improved in, in the creatine versus the placebo group when exercising in the heat. Uh, what we don't have are any cases where anything is worse in the thermoregulatory mm -hmm. space. So either small improvements, uh, but definitely no adverse effects in the muscle area. It's been well studied um, cramps, strains, muscle tears, injuries, um, lost game time, uh, you know, missed practices, things like that. Uh, in some cases, coaches and athletic trainers, oh, they, they, they take such wonderful records. So we have all of this information and we can separate the creates and supplemented athletes and the non supplement athletes. And again, uh, a, a surprising percentage of the time, 
not only is there no increase in muscle dysfunction, there's actually uh, an improved muscle function. Like there's fewer cramps and fewer strains in the creatine group. And, and one way this has been really well studied is by creatine loading people, bringing them into the lab and then subjecting them to a, a brutal type of exercise test. And there has, there's, there are some studies that show a protective effect, less damage to the muscle, less soreness, faster recovery, but there's not a single study that shows increased damage, you know, increased dysfunction. So nothing for thermoregulatory, nothing for muscle dysfunction. And then the last one is kidney health. And this has been done over and over and over again, uh, in some cases for several years. And, and we just haven't seen anything. You know, occasionally we see a small increase in creatinine, mm -hmm. which I think is probably meaningless, particularly in a large um, athlete ingesting creatine that they might have a small increase in creatinine that stays within the normal range. Uh, you know, that's a, a, a blood creatinine measurement might be a, a helpful measurement for renal function. If you have serial measurements, you know, at my age, if I, if I did that every six months and it was trending upward, that would be important to explore. But if, you know, if you have a large muscular athlete who has a higher amount of creatine in their body, a higher urinary creatinine output, and they're also taking creatine, any small increases of blood creatinine that we're seeing, uh, I don't think are, are meaningful. Mm -hmm. I, I think it reveals the weakness of the test. But uh, some of the labs, particularly the team down in Brazil, have used more sophisticated measures of renal function. They found nothing, mm -hmm. no, no, no detrimental effects. So not thermoregulatory, not muscular, and, and not kidney. Uh, and then mm -hmm. there's safety trials in some of the vulnerable populations like ALS patients. And, and again, nothing. It, it appears to be a very, very safe mm -hmm. and well-studied supplement. And, and again, I'll say, why should I be surprised? It's a nutrient, not a drug. Mm -hmm. The South American lab, is that Hamilton Rochelle's lab? It sure is. Yeah. So yeah, they, he's... they do a, a lot of great kidney work. Is, is Hamilton a friend of yours? Yeah, he's been on the show. He's a he's a friend of the podcast. Great guy. So, um, he's, he's I know a great that you, scientist. Yeah, you you guys have collaborated on a, a few things, right? Yes, uh, that's a great team. Uh, he's a he's a great guy. I, I you know uh, I'd love to take a trip down there again. You should come down with us, uh, and, and we'll do some love fun to. creatine studies in Sao yeah. Paulo. I'd love to. Um, <laughs> while we're we're on this uh, topic of of safety. I have a few kind of specific questions, things that I've seen come up or people have asked me. Uh, I get the odd comment about creatine increasing hair loss, particularly in, in genetically susceptible men. And there seems to be this idea out there that it raises DHT levels and this might affect hair. I tried to look into this and it seemed like there wasn't a whole lot of evidence to support that, but uh, I'd, I'd love to hear from you on that. Yeah, it's, I get that question as well. Um, I, I don't know how it started. It, it's possible it could be traced back to this older study, one study that showed a small increase in, in as you said, dihydrotestosterone um, and, and DHT levels are, have to do with male pattern baldness and um, the, the medications that, you know, would, would hopefully, uh, you know, slow down baldness would be DHT, uh, you know, blockers or in mm -hmm. inhibitors. So it, it makes sense on paper, but I'm, I'm not quite sure that one study that showed um, an increase in DHT levels, you know, 20 years ago, and, and the data have never been reproduced. I'm, I'm not sure that's enough to set off the alarm. Um, mm -hmm. be, because again, um, we're, we're talking about a nutrient. So uh, really, if, 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 I ate two large steaks a day. Would would you expect me to ex have accelerated hair loss? Mm. You, you know, when you put it in food context, then it sounds it starts to sound strange. Mm -hmm. I, I do know there's a clinical trial that's underway to to really address this, um, and, but it's ongoing at the moment, so we don't have those data. Um, but it, it's amazing the legs that one study, one odd finding could could have. Um, I would not expect creatine to have a major impact on the endocrine mm -hmm. system because it's it's in the energy metabolism system. It, it's 
it, it, mm-hmm. it just really doesn't cross over there. It's a good scientific principle or learning to to look for reproducibility of of findings. So it'd be interesting to see what that the new study uh, comes up with, what they produce. Uh, yes. What about weight gain? I know that some athletes, for example, boxers or even bodybuilders who are sort of conscious of their weight at particular times leading up to to events uh, and and often avoid creatine at these times in fear that it will uh, lead to water retention. Yes. Well, <clears throat> it, is, is creatine going to increase your total body water? Yes, absolutely. As does carbohydrate loading. So uh, I always start with that because th- there seems to be this this fear of water retention when it's creatine, but um, everyone's okay when it's glycogen, right? Mm. So glycogen retains three times its weight in in, in water, and um, marathon runners deal with it, cyclists deal with it. The thing about creatine is that because once you load your muscles with creatine, once it attracts that water, you can't get it out of the muscle cells just by not eating creatine for a day, right? Uh, Any of your listeners who've experimented with low carbohydrate diets and weight loss know that if they reduce their carbohydrate intake, they'll see rapid weight loss in a few days. And and most of that is glycogen and water. But if you have elevated creatine stores, you're going to have elevated body weight for the next, even if you stop taking creatine for the next four to six weeks. So if you are struggling to make weight, Please stay away from creatine. I, I don't want it to drive you to even more unhealthy um, weight restriction or, or weight loss practices to, to make it into a weight class. Um, we published a case study of an individual who, after a month off creatine, his muscle creatine levels were still more than 20% elevated and his body weight was still very much increased after 30 days off the supplement. Mm-hmm. So, you know, especially if you're a high responder. Right. So if, if you have weight class restrictions and, and you're not, you know, you're going to struggle to make weight, you, you need to think carefully about this because, uh, you know, you can't correct it unless you take a full four to six weeks to get the creatine mm-hmm. and the water out of your, your muscle cells. I think that's an important message. And then mm-hmm. people, I, I think people can make their own decision. Now, I, I think the unexplored area scientifically, I, I think weight class is more of a common sense issue. The, the real scientific issue that hasn't been addressed is um, that some of this weight gain would be uh, metabolically enhanced tissue, uh, for mm-hmm. lack of a better expression, and some of it will be just water, right? So, you know, in endurance sports, if you may lose maybe one or two percent of your body weight, you're probably more efficient and, and even faster over a long, long race. What happens if you gain one or two percent body weight? In, in a long race, you'll be slower. So, what happens? You know, in a sprint, it, it appears that the metabolic benefit out outpaces any weight gain. Mm-hmm. And in, in sports where you're seated, like a uh, crew, like rowing, it appears that the metabolic benefit out outweighs the, the weight gain. Mm-hmm. And when you what say about- metabolic benefit you're talking about the enhanced atp production as a result of having the extra creatine stores despite the extra weight exactly higher starting muscle phosphocreatine levels at the beginning of the race you you will you know be able to last longer or generate more power Mm -hmm. over time um but the weight gain probably won't affect you if you're in a boat it probably won't affect you if you're on a bike it probably won't Mm -hmm. affect you in 10 seconds or less but what if you're a swimmer? Will will the increased body mass increase resistance in the water? You're, you're, you're a little bit larger. It's a good question. Now, there's a lot of studies that show an ergogenic effect of creatine in swimming. Uh, so I, I think the weight gain issue is something that y- you, you have to be in a, a weight-bearing sport like running, and it has to be a very long event. Uh, and, and most of those athletes probably aren't taking creatine Mm. right i I don't have i have evidence that will it will improve your your performance say on on you know the soccer pitch you know you'll you'll have you'll gain half a step or a step on your opponent so uh the metabolic benefit outweighs the the weight gain benefit Mm -hmm. in 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 most situations 
but it, you know, it's possible there's a, a sport out there where uh, the weight gain might be a, a biomechanical disadvantage. And in that instance, it wouldn't mean not using creatine altogether, perhaps, but it would it would mm-hmm. perhaps mean timing when you are supplementing and not, and allowing sufficient time to get the body weight down for an event. Mm-hmm. Sure. And it could be that that's what you use in the off season as part of your strength and conditioning program. Um, but, you know, it, it depends on the, the athlete. Um, I, I have not seen any evidence that there's an ergolytic or, you know, performance decrement type of effect. But in, in theory, there could be a biomechanical disadvantage if you're heavier. Most of this research was done by strapping weights to people's bodies and having them run long distances. Uh, and yes, they, they get slower. Uh, this is a small amount of evenly distributed water weight with a metabolic improvement. Do you have a, a sense for the kind of percentage of athletes, either at an amateur or a professional uh, elite level, that are using creatine versus an anon? Boy, that's a terrific question and, and also not an easy one. Uh, I've learned through... Um, some of my involvement with um, the International Olympic Committee and some uh, really good international scientists who, who work with elite athletes that supplement use is very different from country to country. You know, you, you think it, it's what we emphasize in, in the United States is exactly the same in Finland. And, and of course, it's not even close, you know, from country to country. So there, there's that issue. There is also a sport issue. Right. So in, in American gridiron football, you, you might find very high levels of creatine supplementation. You will find it in American high school gridiron football. Uh, will you find it in gymnastics? Not in the women, possibly in the men. Uh, you know, will you find it in track and field? Absolutely. So I've seen numbers all over the place. Uh, I think the highest group is going to be bodybuilders, powerlifters, and, and the people who are just in the gym working hard. That's those are the groups that create and use is 85% to 100%. Mm-hmm. And then the the rest of your athletes I've seen studies as low as 10% and as high as 55% in, you know, elite uh, amateur and professional athletes, but it's it's just so sport dependent and and even in some sports it's position dependent. You mentioned women there, and that makes me wonder. Uh, in in a number of areas of science, the number of women in studies is is often much lower, and they can be underrepresented for for a variety of reasons. They can be a bit trickier to to sometimes include in a study, particularly um, during pregnancy and and different life stages. But how much of the the creatine research has been in women, and are the the same sort of benefits up for grabs for women as you would expect to see for men? And do we have good sort of safety profile for, say, women that are pregnant and nursing? We have, to, to start with, from a general population perspective, it, it's uh, more of the data are in uh, males. Uh, and, and that's uh, unfortunate, uh, but there are a number of studies that have focused on women and the ergogenic effect appears to be similar, uh, meaning that um, creatine is effective and it's particularly effective in the weight room, uh, you, you know, because the weight, what we do in the weight room is really designed for that phosphocreatine energy system. So th- there are fewer efficacy studies, there are fewer safety studies, but there's enough to convince me that if there's any difference between men and women in the response to creatine supplementation, it, it must be unbelievably small or, or possibly just masked by individual differences. Mm-hmm. Like the, the women may not be vegetarians, but they might be low meat eaters or, or um, they, they might have, you know, a few people might get into a small study who have unusually high natural creatine levels. But uh, anything that pops up in the literature that says, well, there looks like there's a difference here. I'm, I'm not convinced. I, I think mm-hmm. it's the same response, men or women. And um, the, the new research is, is uh, looking at, um, and, and it, this is a very small body of literature, but looking at it across pregnancy uh, using, um, you know, different types of laboratory models, different types of animal models. And, and, and so far, everything looks very, very safe and, and, and promising. I would say, um, you know, the best person to ask would, would be someone like Abby Smith Ryan, mm-hmm. uh, who's who's really has some nice expertise in this area. 
Um, but I have no, I have, a, again, you know, why do we start with the perspective that there could be an adverse event when we're talking about a nutrient? Mm -hmm. You know, if this was a, a carbohydrates supplementation study or a vitamin C supplementation study, you know, would, would we really be saying, you know, oh, is there a difference in metabolism in, 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 in women? Uh, so that's interesting. But I, definitely, we, we would obviously need to be cautious in, in pregnancy studies. Mm -hmm. um, but I'll, I'll say again, if, if a pregnant woman eats, you know, uh, a hamburger and, and, you know, eats an unusually large amount of creatine, are, are we very concerned? Mm -hmm. and, and the answer is no. Yeah, that's an interesting point in, in terms of, where our hypothesis or how our hypothesis may be shaped by bias because if we look at say omega-3 dha for example you mm -hmm. look at population level intake it is low or lower than many would 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 suggest is optimal um, mm -hmm. during pregnancy and, and the hypothesis is that uh, you know adding dha during pregnancy will be beneficial um, so you're right there can be a bit of a different um, starting point for some of these things yes and i think that's kind of the the ergogenic bias and possibly the the muscle building type of, of bias but mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm happy to say that the the number of studies involving women has, has grown uh, and there's a, a lot of good people working in that that space now mm -hmm. what about young children or or what would be the earliest age that you would say there is good data to suggest taking uh, a creatine supplement would be safe and it would be effective is is it uh, young teenagers is it people aged over 16 where would where would you say that would be it would be wise to kind of begin supplementing that's a, another terrific question with with um, uh, the answer is you know context specific um, I answer questions about any supplementation use in children and adolescents from a behavioral perspective before I answer them from a physiological perspective. Uh, and, and usually where I start with is you need to fix your training, you need to fix your, your food, your diet, and you need to fix your sleep. If you've done that and, and you consistently achieve that, then we can talk about certain dietary supplements. But if you are, uh, you know, subconsciously or possibly purposefully making up for, you know, poor diet, lack of sleep or, or haphazard training with a dietary supplement, that, that's the wrong place to, to start. So I, I always come at it from a behavioral perspective. Uh, there are a few well-done studies of creatine supplementation in adolescents. It, uh, um, there is the same ergogenic effect. Um, you know, and, and as we talked about earlier, the ergogenic effect will depend on your starting level of muscle creatine, how large of an increase you get. So there, there's really no difference between mm -hmm. uh, adolescents and adults. But, you know, I'm looking for a, an emotional age or a maturational age, if, if people like that term. Uh, and I, I really don't like the idea of supplements before proper training, proper sleep, proper, mm -hmm. proper nutrition. And, and there are a lot of young people training around me at the gym and, and I know what they're doing and, and uh, a supplement won't fix it. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, uh, I think that's a good reminder for all of us, isn't it? <laughs> to, uh, to, to not forget the, the kind of foundations that, that set us up and, and kind of, sure. uh, you know, get, get, get lost a bit there uh, or distracted, I should say. Uh, in terms of of the dosage, we've spoken about what's been, I guess, validated by science, and you spoke about the maintenance and the loading uh, doses. Is there is there any benefit at all for people exceeding those dosages that you mentioned? And uh, is there a, also a, a kind of upper limit that's been established where you would not want to go over? It's a great question. Uh, for the general population and, and even uh, healthy older adults, uh, I think the 20 grams per day uh, is adequate. And, and if, you, if you look at the urine data during the five-day loading phase, by day three, you're getting 10 grams of creatine coming out in the urine. So 50% of it's coming out in the urine. Uh, you know, uh, it, we certainly don't need 30 grams or 40 grams per day. 
um, it, you know, uh, five days, 20 grams per day is, it really covers 99% of the population. There are some special populations where they've used higher doses, like, um, patients with Huntington's disease, they've used more like 40 grams per day. And, and in the special issue, issue of, um, the brain. So if we're talking about a different tissue, it's mm-hmm. possible that the dose could be different. But I, I think we're covering almost everyone in the population with 20 grams per day for five days or three to five grams per day for about 30 days to get to the same place. Mm-hmm. I think that's a nice segue into cognition and, and brain okay. health here. Can you, can you talk about why the brain as a tissue is particularly interesting when it comes to creatine and perhaps a bit of, about the kind of separation between creatine in the brain versus the, the muscles? Sure. Um, so it's the same basic premise. Your, your brain is very highly metabolic and your brain needs to produce adenosine triphosphate, ATP. So, um, where does your brain get a- ATP? You know, the breakdown of nutrients like glucose, but the brain has creatine as well. So um, the brain relies on creatine and phosphocreatine to replenish ATP when brain activity is high. The big difference between skeletal muscle and brain is that skeletal muscle does not synthesize creatine. So it really is designed to take up creatine from outside sources like endogenously produced or or the diet. The brain does manufacture its own creatine and regulates its own creatine content. So as as you would would know, and and most would guess, the brain is very protective and resistant to most substances. You know, there's not a lot of things that are going to easily pass Mm. the blood-brain barrier, and supplemental creatine is likely one of them. So um, the brain handles things under normal circumstances. But if you're at the extreme end of the scale, uh, for instance, the children with the genetic defects um, who have problems with creatine synthesis or creatine transport, um, we can increase their brain creatine levels a lot and and restore them to health. The the more difficult question is for someone like me, um, can I increase my brain creatine levels? And then what sort of performance enhancing or cognitive enhancing effects would I get. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I think we, we have a small but very interesting body of literature. And, and the first part of that body of literature would be, can we increase brain creatine with supplementation? And, and the answer appears to be yes. So um, there are, I, I think there are a dozen creatine supplementation studies now that are um, simple creatine supplementation with pre and post brain measurements. And nine out of the 12 showed a significant increase in brain creatine. Mm -hmm. Now, this increase is more on the order of 5% with a few studies. Can I ask you a question on that? Yes, sir. Uh, You you spoke earlier about uh, an MRI or Mm -hmm. a muscle biopsy. How do you go about measuring creatine in the brain? Uh, presumably, it's a little bit more difficult and, and probably requires some uh, different expertise, I imagine. And, and also, how do you choose you know, what part of the brain you're going to look at? Yes, you, you have in one question highlighted all of the p- complications and problems in this body of literature. <laughs> so... Um, With skeletal muscle, we have this, and and it may not be completely accurate, but we work off this assumption that if we're all studying the vastus lateralis, the muscle biopsy um, reflects what's going on in the entire muscle. And if I compare the creatine content of, you know, the quadricep in labs from Australia and the UK and Canada and the United States, it will make sense using the muscle biopsy technique. When you use an MRI, when you use a magnetic resonance spectroscopy, you can't really compare across labs like that. You can compare percent change, but not actual concentration. With the, the biopsy technique, I'm confident. So I could actually look at a study done in Australia and say, 
those people had low creatine mm-hmm. and, 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 you know, that number would make sense to everyone in the world with the, the magnet work. I, I have more confidence in just saying a, a percent change pre to post supplementation than I do actually comparing the concentration. So we cannot do biopsies in the brain, or at least they won't let us. So we have to use, uh, you know, uh, spectroscopy. So you stick your head in the MRI, you lie in the magnet, and are there um, <laughs> differences between the different, re- are there creatine content differences in different regions of the brain? Yes, there are. Hmm. <laughs> so um, we have to figure out, uh, and we haven't yet, are we all looking at the same part of the brain? The very first study that came out in 1998, Deshent and colleagues, they showed that you could increase brain creatine with oral supplementation. And they got about 10% increase, less than muscle, absolutely less than muscle. But they also showed pre to post measurements in different regions of the brain. And it was impressive how uh, your results could really be different if, if you didn't measure several regions of the brain or we each measured a different one across labs. Uh, and that's a complication. So you have to have access to an MRI they have to be able to do spectroscopy and they have to be interested in creatine supplementation research. So the mm-hmm. brain literature is right away much smaller than the muscle literature. And you mentioned before that uh, you spoke about young people with a traumatic brain injury mm-hmm. and, and perhaps in certain scenarios you may be able to get supplemental creatine to cross the blood-brain barrier. Yes. Is is that uh, likely just the body kind of self-regulating? And if an endogenous production is down within the, the the central nervous system within the brain, that it's it then is permitting creatine from the peripheral part of the body to actually come through. Is that the kind of proposed mechanism? Yeah, that's kind of how I picture it, um, and I think it's it's possible that an endogenous production in the brain is down, but it's very likely that uh, need increases. So w- w- in the case of a traumatic brain injury, there's a real energy crisis that's set off, and th- there's research to show that brain creatine decreases following a concussion, a traumatic brain injury. So right away, we have decreased brain creatine. This Mm. seems like a circumstance where supplementation would benefit. But then there's this energy crisis that spreads over the brain. There is depolarization of membranes. There's all of these things that need more energy. And brain creatine appears to be depleted. So this might be a time when uh, acute supplementation could really benefit brain tissue uh, when there's an acute need, uh, at least that, that's how we've been picturing it. That, um, you know, um, it, it, if someone had, a, you know, an acute need for creatine, like a brain injury, there could be a real benefit. But also, if you had a chronic energy crisis, and this would be schizophrenia, certain types of depression, and um, and, and maybe even physical frailty in old age, that would be a long-term chronic reduction of brain creatine that would also benefit from supplementation. Mm. Are there any trials that have looked at, at some of these different populations, whether it's uh, young persons with TBI or um, you know footballers with chronic traumatic encephalopathy um, or some of these more kind of degenerative diseases that you've mentioned there and supplemented with creatine and seen any change in outcomes? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Uh, I think that the body of literature on depression is the strongest because the group that does this research, they are um, well, well, they're they're clinical psychologists and spectroscopists, and so that they they know what they're doing with depression and they know what they're doing with measuring brain phosphocreatine, and they developed an interest in supplementation. So, first, it looks like. It's a certain type of drug-resistant depression in, in women uh, that uh, responds well. So you see an increase in brain creatine and some resolution of, of symptoms of depression. Uh, that's to me, is a very uh, strong, well-defined body of literature. The concussion literature, unfortunately, comes mostly from 
theoretical models and animal models and, and some observations. Uh, and normally I won't talk about animal research at all, mm. but the thing about creatine is that we have hundreds of studies on efficacy and safety, and it's relatively inexpensive, widely available. If you are at a high risk for a brain injury, then I think it's probably more prudent to recommend that you add creatine supplements to your diet if, if you're a high risk for a brain injury, if you're in a high risk sport. So the animal data, uh, and again, I don't like citing animal data, but it's it's compelling that hypoxic or traumatic induced brain injury in animals, uh, oh, they have a massive reduction in tissue damage if you create and load them, like a 50% reduction in tissue damage. And there are, there's one lab in, in New Zealand that has done um, a hypoxic challenge where they have people breathe low oxygen air and it induces symptoms of um, concussion. It induces, you know, cognitive deficits. Uh, they, those individuals are rescued when they're creatine supplemented. The, the damage is attenuated. And, and probably the most compelling data comes from an um, open source trials in hospitals of children with brain injuries. And, and there's a few studies that show remarkable improvement in recovery from brain injury in, in children. And, and, you know, concussions are complicated, both in the extent of the injury and the recovery. But uh, this would be just across the board benefits in terms of mood, in terms mm. of fatigue, in terms of headaches, in terms of um, mental clarity, uh, it, it seemed to really help these hospitalized children. So I know there's some ongoing work in uh, collegiate athletes, mm -hmm. uh, but this is hard work to do because we don't know who is going to get a concussion mm -hmm. or the, the severity of it. Now, now I will say that uh, because you mentioned uh, the CTE mm -hmm. issue, there, there's one group in, in the U.S. that ha seems to have access to the NFL players after they retire and, and even after they pass on. And, and they have a very interesting paper that where they've isolated um, symptomatic retired NFL football players. So many years past their career and they're, they're symptomatic. They've had repeated head injuries and they still have symptoms related to those head injuries. Those individuals have depressed levels of brain creatine. Mm. Which really points to like uh, a long-term energy crisis, and and again I'll say, um, why are we hesitating? We have this well-studied, safe, effective, inexpensive supplement. Why wouldn't we be trying it in this in this instance? Mm. Yeah, it'd be interesting in that population, uh, even at, at that time of their life, to see whether intervening with creatine supplementation. Um, in a sort of randomized controlled trial manner led to any improvements in their cognition? Sure. Well, the, you know, the, the straight up cognitive studies, and, and this is interesting because it seems like the people who can measure cognition pre and post supplementation, those aren't the people who can measure brain creatine. Mm. So there's almost no overlap between the, the studies where they measure brain creatine, uh, except for Hamilton's group down there. They, where they measure brain creatine pre and post supplementation and also cognition. There's 16 cognition studies now, and 13 of them show improved cognitive performance. A couple of them were in vegetarians. Uh, most of them were not. A um, couple of them were in older adults. Some of them were um, at rest in, in well-rested individuals. And in some cases, they really stressed people with sleep deprivation and stressful exercise. Mm -hmm. And, and the, you know, the cognitive disruption that that creates was rescued by the creatine supplement. Mm -hmm. So it, it's been addressed in a couple of different unique ways. And I'm, I'm very optimistic with the consistency of the findings, you know, imp improved mm. different aspects of cognition, different tests, but um, some aspect of cognition improved with supplementation. That's very powerful for a single nutrient. Is it possible that creatine could be exerting these benefits on cognition through other pathways other than actually getting into the brain tissue itself? Could it, can it affect glucose metabolism or, or different pathways within the body? It's, it's always possible. You know, we're, we're going for the, the obvious place, which is energy metabolism in the brain. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and, and we know we can increase brain creatine about five or 10% with monohydrate supplements, but it, it's quite possible that it's something else altogether. There, there's, you know, a, a small amount of research relating creatine to glucose metabolism. Um, but nothing that makes me think that that's, that's, uh, mm -hmm. the mechanism that that's what's going on here. I think it probably has to do with the fact that a stressed brain is in a real energy crisis, mm -hmm. uh, either chronic or acute. So whether it's a, a traumatic brain injury or um, frailty in very, very old individuals uh, or some sort of disease, uh, I, I think these are probably the most optimal places for creatine supplementation mm -hmm. uh, to, have, to have a large impact on cognition. And so you, you, you believe that the typical person can perhaps increase their brain creatine stores by 5 to 10%. and. Yeah. Just circling back to the dosages we mentioned before, I just wanted to confirm, is that through the same sort of dosage uh, protocol uh, as, as in the studies that we're looking at muscle and performance? Well, it hasn't been well addressed. So what, we're, what we can recommend right now is to use the, mu the muscle doses because we have so much data on safety and efficacy in the muscles. Uh, and we have some data to say that this is an effective way to increase brain creatine. But, you know, we just don't have the dose response, escalating dose types of studies. Uh, again, you know, very few people have a magnet uh, in the research world. And, you know, th this is a, a, an unfortunately a very practical situation that you, you're often competing for magnet time with diagnostic radiology. And and they win. They win every time. My my little creatine studies do not compete well against, you know, real clinical diagnoses. So if you have access to a research dedicated magnet, you can do this research. And there's just not that many of them out there and we can't do brain biopsies. So it's mm -hmm. going to be a slowly growing body of literature. And, you know, I'm hoping to do myself some escalating dose studies, even on a case study basis where we, we could give the same individual, you know, more than one MRI uh, and, and we can track brain creatine levels, kind of like what we've done with muscle and urine mm -hmm. and, and different doses uh, in for, you know, to look at the skeletal muscle response. So I, I think those, those types of investigations are coming, uh, but, but they'll be slow because there's, there's just no, no way to biopsy the brain. Mm -hmm. Not, not, not at my institution. <laughs> With regards to people playing contact sport and, and those that are subject to collisions, and you mentioned the NFL players there, do you sort of think as a general rule of thumb, it's a, it's a good idea to be supplementing with creatine, uh, not just for the performance benefits, but the potential uh, protective benefits in the, in the brain? And, and second part of that question is, I'm wondering or curious, is anyone actively having that discussion within the NFL? I think they are, and I think it's I think they're having it in the NCAA too, but they're probably having it at the level of the team, at the level of the sport nutritionist and the sports scientist. And it's probably not um, talked about outside of the locker room, so to speak. Uh, we're certainly talking about it, the creatine researchers. and in, in fact, in our last paper, our last review on creatine and brain health, that's really what we end with is, is this question, you know, uh, isn't it more prudent to in ingest a nutrient that um, Im improves your muscle function, has ergogenic benefits, and has an excellent safety profile? Your diet might be deficient in it. It's inexpensive. It's widely available. And if you're in a contact sport, which is most of them, uh, it, it could help reduce the severity of or enhance the recovery from a traumatic brain injury. If you're a high-risk player or let's say you've already had one or two concussions, then isn't it more prudent to recommend we go forth with the supplementation rather than wait mm -hmm. five or ten years for more more research? You know, I, you I, I say we go forward. You mentioned uh, vegetarians and cognition. A moment ago, and that actually um, gets me thinking. I think the, there's a study by uh, Benton. Yes, I think it's Benton and uh, colleagues. It was mm -hmm. 2010 or 2011, uh, somewhere around there, and and they were specifically looking at supplementation of 
creatine. I think it was a four or five day sort of protocol. Um, and it was up around that 20 grams a day or 25 grams a day, something like that. And they, they did see a significant difference in memory, I believe, between the vegetarians and the omnivores. And I've seen people uh, interpret that study differently um, depending on what kind of dietary camp they're from, which is always fun to kind of um, to, to sort of uh, look at through, through different lenses and, and see how people are coming to their kind of uh, conclusions. But w- when I look at that study... I look at the the. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the the actual results, but the the baseline data sort of suggested that they were performing quite similarly. But then after supplementing, the vegetarians saw greater improvement. Um, which I'm not I'm not sure if that is a, a kind of uh, negative finding for vegetarians or or more of a positive finding. Um, but I'd, l- I'd love to hear your thoughts just in general, either on that study or. Uh, on vegetarians and supplementing creatine from a, a cognitive benefit point of view. Well, that you're right. That was a very interesting study and, and a difficult to interpret study as well. Um, so, how do we even a, a, approach this question? It, it, it's quite fascinating. Uh, I'll tell you. You know, I'm I'm a, a muscle physiologist. I'm a neck down physiologist. The only reason I started to even remember that I had a brain was because creatine research took me into the brain and then I had to start thinking about the brain. So I contacted some very smart uh, psychologists, some um, military psychologists, people who really were good at measuring brain performance. And what I learned quickly was that every lab seems to disagree with each other on every measurement. Mm. This was this was frightening for me uh, as a young investigator because if you and I measured strength from the other side of the world, we would probably really understand the way we measured muscle strength or muscle power. Um, but all of these labs and all of these studies assess memory and, and um, you know mathematical processing and short term memory and long term memory. They assess them differently, mm. and um, that. You know, when I first started this, I would hear, I don't believe their data. I don't believe, I don't believe that that test can show that effect. Uh, so it was, it was very frustrating because I was bringing these papers published from great labs and in fantastic journals to other, uh, you know, to psychologists. And they just said, nope, we can't, we can't do that. So it made the studies harder to compare for me. And, and that's the first thing, um, that, that, that I have to say. But then, you know, one of the most important findings that came out after that Benton study was from the the team in Brazil uh, with Solis, uh, S-O-L-I-S is the first author. And what they showed was uh, if you compare vegetarians and omnivores, omnivores have higher muscle creatine to start with. And if you supplement them, vegetarians have a larger increase because they're starting with a lower point, a lower baseline. If you look at the diet, Vegetarians eat almost no creatine, whereas omnivores eat quite a bit. Uh, but if you look at brain creatine, they were identical between the groups. So it's as if the brain figures out what to do to something like um, a, a vegetarian diet. And then when you supplement, I'm not sure that um, we could expect the same response we get in muscle, because in, in some cases we get not only do we not get a larger increase in the vegetarian group in the brain tissue, we might not get any increase at all mm-hmm. in omnivores or vegetarians. So it, it, it's just a matter of, of really looking at the brain in a completely different way than, than skeletal muscle. Uh, and th- then realizing that, you know, uh, out of the 16 studies on, on creatine and cognition, 13 of them showed an effect. There were, uh, there's no overlap between the tests. <laughs> Everybody used different methods and, in fact, different populations. And, you know, even in the the populations that we think we know a fair bit about, like the study on the elderly, what was their dietary creatine intake? Was it comparable to the vegetarians in Benton uh, or was it comparable to the omnivores? It's a really messy body of literature. 
uh, but with a very unanimous finding of improved cognition. That's what that's what inspires me to to stay in this space and keep studying it. Um, but I, with the muscle, I expect the vegetarians to have a bigger response. With the brain, mm-hmm. I'm not so sure. I think the brain has protected brain creatine levels um, because I don't think I don't think becoming a vegetarian drains brain creatine as much as it does blood creatine mm-hmm. and muscle creatine. I really don't. You mentioned that was a wandering uh, answer. <laughs> no, that was that was great. You mentioned a couple of the the studies that or the case studies that you're looking to do, potentially following someone and and scanning them on multiple occasions and looking at brain creatine and mm-hmm. some work that others are doing in this space. But I'm I'm also curious outside of that, with the current kind of gaps in the literature and questions that you are are interested in. What other studies do you either know about or would you like to see sort of conducted in this space of brain health and creatine? Oh, I think we need what we really need is um, a group that can measure cognition well and also changes in brain creatine well. Uh, and um, and this is probably going to be a multi-site type of collaborative effort to get this done. Um, but uh, you know, we have the brain data and we have the cognitive data and we have almost no overlap. So the first thing we need to do, even if it's a repeat of young, healthy individuals or vegetarians versus omnivores, we need to have brain measurements of, of creatine content with cognitive processing outcomes. Then after that, we can start to change the population, maybe with the same research design, hop to uh, older adults. Uh, or, or vegetarians and non-vegetarians. And, and at the same time, I think some small dose escalation studies or case studies would be very, very valuable because, you know, with one individual, we can do more than one MRI and we can measure in multiple parts of the brain. Uh, but, but that's really difficult to do in a large randomized controlled mm-hmm. trial. So step one, seeing if there's a, a correlation between brain yeah. creatine and, and cognition. Right. It answers your earlier question. What if it's not as simple as you're improving mm. brain energetics? What about the, and this is, this is kind of my final question here, what about the delivery method? Given the, the blood-brain barrier, do you think that it's possible a different creatine compound mm-hmm. uh, may be better at, at getting um, you know, into the, the brain tissue? That's a great question. And it's um, I think there are more people in industry trying to come up with a, a product they can sell than there are people in academ- academia in- trying to answer that question. So one person who's done this from a research perspective is, is Serge uh, Ostrich, and he's studied uh, guanidino acetate. So uh, he's, he's studied a precursor of creatine, which mm-hmm. is quite fascinating because Throughout the, the, the history of dietary supplements, when we feed people precursors, it almost never works. It almost never turns into the desired product, at, you know, with supplementation. But in this case, it looks like this compound can also increase brain creatine and can also improve cognition. So I think that's a valuable pathway to pursue. Uh, but we know a lot about the lack of toxicity and the great safety profile of creatine. Mm-hmm. And we don't know it about any of these other compounds. Uh, unfortunately, as I, I said, a lot of this seems to be coming from industry. It's winding up in things that look like energy drinks. And they're just, you know, they're, they're uh, adding a compound to the creatine and saying, you know, we did a, a rat study and mm-hmm. it, it got into the rat's brain. So now we're going to market it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and I, don't like, yeah. I don't like that approach. But I think precursor compounds are, are, have a good shot here. I don't think it will be as simple as add carbohydrate and add protein because the brain's even resistant to insulin where insulin really turns the muscle on, you know, to, to take up glucose and to take up creatine. So it's the, the brain's protective for a reason. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think precursors ha- have a real potential here and, and monohydrate in the right dose at the right time with the right population has potential here. Certainly uh, an interesting space to to watch. Eric, this has been super informative. I know that I've learned a lot. Thank you so much for taking the time to share with us today. Is there anything that you wanted to add that perhaps we missed or, or do you think we did a good job covering things? 
I think we did a great job covering things, but I can talk about creatine for weeks and weeks. Uh, I'll say one thing to, to your listeners so they don't have to listen to me go on and on. Uh, the, the recent creatine conference uh, was based on um, a collection of articles that some of the world's greatest creatine researchers published and made them all open access. So the, mm-hmm. the journal Nutrients has an entire issue dedicated to creatine. So if you have m- more specific questions about creatine in cognition, creatine in pregnancy, creatine in rehabilitation, creatine in sports, creatine in, in any tissue or population, the entire special issue of Nutrients, which you can download any of the articles for free, is available online now. Mm-hmm. So for the interested listener, they can really take a deep dive into their, their particular interest. Yeah, that's fantastic. I'll I'll uh, put that in the show notes. I have a copy of that. So that'll be in the show notes for those that want to do a bit of further reading. And if you're watching on YouTube, you can see that on the screen now. If if folks listening would like to, to get in touch with you or stay up to date with your uh, own research, where's the, the best place to send them? Um, the only social media I have is, is Twitter. So you can find me on, on Twitter. Uh, it's, uh, at Eric Ross and PhD, uh, or you can email me at my university email address. That's my first initial E, my last name, Rawson at messiah.edu. Um, happy to, happy to help, happy to chat about dietary supplements in general and, and creatine in particular. Perfect. I'll put all of that in the show notes as well. Thanks again, Eric. Thank you. Thank you for joining me for this episode and your interest in science-based conversation. I hope you enjoyed it and found the information covered interesting and instructive. If you did and you'd like to show your support for the show, please subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can stay up to date with new episodes and watch them in video format. Yes, the full-length videos. Please also consider subscribing to the show on the Spotify and or Apple podcast app, wherever you enjoy listening to podcasts. You can also leave a review on Apple or Spotify. Again, a great way to support the show and make our content more discoverable for others to enjoy and learn from. If you have any comments about the episodes, suggestions for future episodes, including guests you'd like to see on the show or questions that you'd like to have answered, please leave those in the comments section on YouTube. I myself and my team will take note of these comments when planning future episodes. Finally, the best way to support the show and receive discounts on products we love is by checking out our sponsors at theproof.com forward slash friends. Enjoy your week, stay well, and I look forward to catching you in the next episode.